Welcome to Sermons from Calvary. My name is Bruce Martin, I'm the pastor, and I give you a personal invitation to stay with us for the next 30 minutes. Lee Zell, that great humor therapist, sharing her story, The Missing Piece. You won't want to miss it. Stay with us. What a joy to be in Upper Canada. I live in California in Lower Canada. And I am so grateful for the wonderful people I have been with up here. And I will try as I'm having an opportunity to speak with you now not to make too many mistakes. I heard of a florist in New Jersey who had a mistake happen. His delivery boy had two bunches of flowers and he swapped them and took them to the wrong places. One was going to an office that had opened up a brand new location and the other was going to a funeral and this guy took him to the wrong places. So the next morning, the fellow who owns the business called up the florist and said, I bud, what are you doing? Like your guy comes over here yesterday, we're having a big party, we got balloons, we got a band, everything is great, and he puts this big black wreath in there, it says, rest in peace. Huh? What's that about? And the Jersey florist said, well, bud, don't feel bad. He said, you know, the one that went to the funeral, it said, good luck in your new location. <laughs> what? want to be careful if I, as I have a chance to share with you. I want to talk for just a bit this morning about the subject of what I call missing pieces in the puzzle of life. If you thought of your life as a puzzle, there are so many folks who have a missing piece, like someone took their fist and punched a hole in your life, and for you there is something definitely missing. Maybe it's a person a dream, a financial setback, <clears throat> a physical problem. Many, many people have missing pieces in the puzzle of their life. I understand, I was told by my father that I should not have been a piece of the puzzle of life. I was supposed to be Lee, his son, and I couldn't pass the physical for that. So <laughs> I began my life knowing I was a mistake. You know, one of those kind of kids that comes along and uh, not being raised with any kind of faith. Both my parents were alcoholics, and we had a lot of abuse and battering in my home. Not a very nice way for five little girls to grow up. And yet, somehow, because of the grace of God, I read in the paper about this preacher called, I never heard of him, Billy Graham. I don't know, maybe you've heard of him now. He's getting big and had this meeting in a town in, in Philadelphia where I was raised. I went there, sat way up in the peanut gallery, and there for the first time, I heard the truth about God. Not just this man's personal philosophy, but it was amazing how he could show from the Bible that becoming a Christian is something you do. I thought you got religion from your parents and my parents were not religious so that's why I never got it but he showed me that God has no grandchildren oh no that this thing of coming to God is a one-on-one -on -one thing that you and God connect through the work of the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I walked down. I made my trip to the altar. I received Christ into my heart. And I remember thinking, oh, thank God, bad things won't happen to me anymore. <sighs> oh, some of you people already know about this. Huh? Okay, good. No, I didn't know. I just went home figuring things would be a lot better. And for me, they got a lot worse. And as I left Philadelphia, I headed out to... California on a bus because I'd seen all those beautiful California people and they looked so great from a distance. <laughs> and then I got out there and I found out that, you know, people are the same all over, really. The changes God wants to do in our lives 
are not outward as much as inward changes. And I began my first job fresh out of high school as a little typist. And there at the place where I worked, a salesman whom I met in the morning would rape me that night as a virgin teenager and a brand new Christian. I was a very traumatized teenager who did not understand why this would have to happen to me. I stopped in a gas station to clean myself up. I felt very, I, I don't know, it's hard to explain when you have been victimized and yet you feel like you're guilty. Why do victims feel guilty? I stopped in that gas station. I said to myself, Lee, you're always at the wrong place at the wrong time. You, you, you attract losers to yourself like a white silk blouse attracts spots. This is just another thing in your, you weren't supposed to be born. Okay, don't tell anyone that this happened to you because it'll be the confirmation that you're a loser. And I decided right there I'd go to my grave with that secret and did not call the police. Not a good idea, but I went back to work the next day never to see the salesman again and begin my process of pretending that everything was okay when everything is, was not okay. And when you have a missing piece, something punched out of your life, you do not understand why. But some smart person said, we're only as sick as our secrets. And I'm afraid that's too true for many people who have a, this missing piece, this untold story in their life, as I did. I went back to work and pretended, although I was very sick emotionally and physically, and went to the doctor for a flu shot, and he said, you're pregnant. Congratulations. I said, no. No, you see, I, I'm an unwanted child. I can't be pregnant with an unwanted child. And I could not put together how life could be so unfair. As I would talk to my girlfriend about what had happened, she offered to take me for an abortion. And she said she'd helped her uh, cousin have an abortion. It meant we went to Mexico and it wasn't too bad. I'm so grateful that easy out was not available to me because I have many friends who've had abortions and they have a missing piece in their life. And I am so grateful that because of the blood of Jesus, they can come through their process of forgiveness and healing and wholeness and restoration again, looking forward to a day when they see that baby in a place where there's no sorrow and there's no grief because of the cross of Christ. I wasn't sure what I'd do and frantically searching for some kind of direction from God, I would flip through a Gideon Bible in a hotel. And if you brought your Bibles, you may want to turn to these wonderful verses with me. In Psalm 139, we see King David talking very clearly. King David said in Psalm 139, beginning with verse 13, talking to God. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are, are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place when I was woven together in the womb. Your eyes saw my unformed body. And all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Oh, this was a, so surprising to me that something so clear was in the Bible. But, but actually, I wasn't sure it counted because I knew it was in the Jewish half of the Bible. And I thought that they get all of this and then we get a few little pages back. I'm so glad. This book is one. And David was trying to tell us 
that even though a couple decides when to make love, God decides when to make life. And if that's true, God decided on every one of you, and, and even on me. And I decided maybe the same with this baby that I did not volunteer for as a result of my being raped. No, I thought I will go full term with the pregnancy. I'll find a way to, to make it happen. Wound up in Los Angeles in Southern California in a very loving church with a lot of caring people. And it would be while I was with them that I decided that I thought I should have the baby adopted. And I asked God to give me a, like a, a sign. And I got it, actually, strangely enough, watching the old movie on television, The Ten Commandments. Remember? When mo the mother of Moses put little baby Charlton Heston in the basket and sent little Chuck down the Nile River, you know. If any of her neighbors would have been standing on the banks of the river, can you imagine what they would have said? Hey, this mother, she's throwing away the baby in the water from who's picking up. She doesn't know, she doesn't care, such a mother. You could die from such a mother. But the mother of Moses had direction from God that another mother was supposed to raise her baby and she couldn't pick the mother. And I thought, that's what, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put this baby on the river of Los Angeles County adoptions processing and I'm going to trust God for whatever Pharaoh's daughter type person fishes the baby out. And I would give birth one morning to the biggest missing piece in my life in a county hospital in Los Angeles without two nickels to rub together. I gave birth to a baby girl whom I never saw, I never held. I was told, you had a healthy baby girl, you're gone at 10.30, that was it. I, I felt so cheated. I kept saying to myself, well, you'll have other children, you're so young. I never would have imagined that that would be the only child I would give birth to. But adoption records were sealed. And I knew that that was a, a closed chapter of my life. And I'd have to find a way to go on. And I found so many good people who had very bad things happen to them in their lives. And I discovered that it seems like in life pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. For those who have a connection with God through Jesus Christ. And I would later marry a man who ironically had two children whom I adopted. I stood in an adoptions court in Los Angeles again and adopted two daughters. So I know a little bit about adoption. And through the years my husband would always say, should we search and find that you're missing peace? baby? I'd say no. Because I told God that I would leave it up to him. I, I believed that he would be able to keep that which I committed unto him and that if he wanted us ever to find each other, then he would have to do it. And I knew God was able, but I, I was finding out as a new Christian that God was so capable. Do you know that we serve a God who is in control? Ooh, I am so grateful for that. If that weren't true, I would not be here today. No, we serve a God, like who sits up there in his heaven in some big executive desk, big as this thing. And it is from that desk where he is the executor of the universe, able to make all things work together for good. The God who says, I know the plans I have for you. They're plans for good, not for evil to give you a future, to give you a hope. Oh, this is the God we serve. And the Bible tells us in Job that even if Satan wants to do something to you in your life, he has to fill out a requisition. And God has to take that as he did with Job and say, no, no. Uh, okay, half of this, no, not that. And God has to like 
stamp it, like approve it before it went into the life of Job. And so it is the same for us. That God sits up there at his executive desk in heaven with two big rubber stamps. I don't know what requests may be coming across God's desk for you today. Maybe it says, can his car break down on the way home from the church on Sunday? God may say, yes. <laughs> he will not be happy with me about this. And he'll just be all upset. But I'm the other driver and then the, the police, that he, I, the, the, he's going to be building his testimony today. This is going to be fabulous, really. Not today, but it will be fabulous. God, well, I don't know. Maybe the request coming across God's desk today says, can the washing machine break down? God will probably say, no. You know, they've had so many things break down lately that I know. We're not letting that. Maybe it says, can she lose her best friend? God may say, uh, yes. Because I notice that she talks more to her friend than she does to me. She calls on her before she calls on me. I'm a jealous God. Maybe the request coming across God's desk today says, can the mother-in-law move back in? God would say, no! Get that thing out of here! So God sits up there at his great big executive desk in heaven. The God who is able to make all things work together for good for those who love him. I never imagined a request was coming across God's desk for me. And it would say, can I find Lee, my birth mother? And one day God would say, yes. And I would be sitting at home, minding my own business, pick up the telephone, the voice on the end of the phone says, hello, uh, you've never met me, but you're my mother. And I was so like, beam me up, Scotty. It was just so unreal as this wonderful voice on the end of the phone, the missing piece of my life, says that she wanted to find me to let me know that I'm a grandmother. I have grandchildren in Michigan. And the second reason for her seeking to find me was even better than the first, because in that first conversation, that child tried to do what she always dreamed someday she could do, and that was she tried to lead me to Jesus on the telephone. And I let her go a while to see if she was any good. <laughs> so bad. Oh, she knew what she was doing. I said, oh, oh Julie, I think you're trying to lead me to Jesus, but you already did that, see, many, many years ago. And it would be that beautiful girl that would have led me how to walk with God when life's not fair. To learn the good God who stands up there waiting to make all things work together. Oh, wow. We met... And we have a picture of her, I think, through the door of a hotel room walked this girl who looked quite a bit like me. <laughs> the first thing she ever said to me as she passed me a baby was, now go to your grandma. And her husband stood there, I think, I think he rehearsed it. He stretched out his hand. He said, I, I would like to shake your hand. I want to say thank you for not aborting Julie. Because I don't know what my life would be like without her and my children. And together we would look at baby pictures. We would talk about life that she had lived. Ah, this neat girl. They would encourage me to write the book, The Missing Piece, that took us on a real whirlwind of talk shows on television and radio. Thank you for that picture and all kinds of things. 
I remember when I was asked to be on the Phil Donahue show that I had Christians calling me saying, you're not going to go, are you? Don't you know? He's the worst sleaze bag, dirt face, garbage mouth. I said, no, you know, isn't that great? <laughs> you know, maybe I got this thing wrong, but I thought we were supposed to take this good news outside the stained glass. And we were supposed to tell the wonderful story of redemption of our God. Oh, it was a thrill to sit next to her on those talk shows. I, I remember the time she said to the host, yes, I'm the result of rape, but I'm so glad I did not get the death penalty for the crime of my father. I did nothing wrong. She said, even children who are born out of sexual assault do not automatically inherit evil genes. In this life, it doesn't really matter how you begin, but what you become. Oh, yes. And in your life, regardless of the missing pieces, the unanswered questions in your life, God is still there. Where is God? God is in the same place he was when he watched them nail his son to the cross. And he witnessed man's inhumanity to man as he watched his son die as a lamb slain for our sins. Oh, my friends, I can guarantee you if you have a missing piece in your life, Wow, I can, I can just guarantee you that God did not make that happen. God doesn't look down here on planet Earth and say, what else can I cook up to mess their lives up? Oh, I'm going to send a little cancer, teach them a lesson. Yeah, I'm going to send a drunk... Dr no, not the God of the Bible. Because the God of the Bible doesn't send bad things, but he's the only one who can make good out of bad things that happen in our lives. I, I learned this because I live in California where we have earthquakes. And I remember the first earthquake we had that made a crack in my cement in the patio. I called the insurance company to come and fix it. And the agent said, is this as a result of the earthquake? I said, yeah. You say, oh no, we don't cover that because that's called an act of what? God. Act of God. Act of God? What? Do you think God sits up there in heaven at his big executive desk and says, you California people tick me off. I'm giving you a 7.5 earthquake. How do you like that? Huh? You don't straighten up, I'll give you an 8.9. I'll shake you up. No, I don't think so. Earthquakes are not an act of Father God. They're an act of Mother Nature. Let's lay the blame at the door of sin, shame, sickness, Satan in our world. Satan does not work for God. He's self-employed. So let's remember. The bad things that happen to us in our life are not brought to us by God to teach us a lesson because we have no idea what it means. We have no idea why we would be punished. No, no, no. Not the good God. Not the God who will never say one thing as he looks down here on planet Earth. I believe God will never say, oh, oh, oops. Whoa, I don't believe that happened to him. That came out of left field. Boy, I wasn't expecting that. I, I don't know. What can I do now? You know, my hands are tied here. Not our God. Not the restorer of the breach. Not the shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Oh, no. He is the one who is able to do in our lives what we are not able to do because of the work on the cross. 
We can take the missing pieces of our lives and we can hand them over to the hands of the man who stills the waters, nail-scarred hands. Hands of one who himself once cried, My God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, a man who was despised, rejected. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Oh, yes, we are dealing with a God who understands what it is to live on this planet and to suffer things. My friends, it could be that this morning is your moment as I have had mine to hand over to our Savior that missing piece in your life, that unanswered question, that thing that was wrong. It was totally wrong. It it, it just should have never happened, but it did happen. And I know that God can take the worst thing that's happened to you in your life and make it into the best thing that's ever happened to you in your life. Now that takes holy hands. Holy hands. And I invite you this morning to do that, to turn your life over to the Savior, to say, I don't know what happened. I I didn't have control, but I give my life over to you. I believe Jesus died for me on the cross. I receive him in my life. And for those of you who have the Lord living in your life, this may be a moment for you to come forward and hand over. Let's do it. The missing piece of your life. It's about time. It's about time for a number of you to do this. Pastor Martin here with a word at the close of today's program. You know, in my pastoral ministry, it is true. There's no subject that evokes response like forgiveness. And that certainly was true in the messages that have been shared this past year. Many people have asked if those messages could be put in print. And I've put them in this little booklet, Practical Messages on a Thought-Provoking Theme, Forgiveness. And if you'd like this little booklet, would you write me this week, Sermons from Calvary, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C286. And when you write, remember this is a viewer-supported program. I particularly need to hear from those who have never written before. Please send us your most generous gift. Everything you give will go to help provide airtime in your area. God bless you for writing Sermons from Calvary. And remember the booklet on forgiveness, and I'll send it to you this week. God bless you. For those living in Winnipeg and surrounding area, let me assure you that you're welcome at our Sunday services. At 9.40 in the morning, we have a traditional music worship experience. At 11 o'clock, a more blended contemporary worship experience. And at 6 o'clock, something for the entire family. We are located at 440 Hargrave Street, right in downtown Winnipeg. And for church information, give us a call during office hours at 943-4551 or visit us on our website at www.calvarytemplewinnipeg.com.